Thank you. The next item of business and the final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 13646 in the name of Bill Kidd on UN International Day of Peace 2018. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Bill Kidd to open the debate. Mr Kidd, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It helps us speak into the microphone. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I would first of all like to thank all of the colleagues here in the chamber um, who have stayed back, uh, but particularly those who actually signed and supported the motion that I'm now bringing forward for debate. And this recognises International Day of Peace 2018. Every year this is celebrated on the 21st of September, and this year it falls on Friday of this week. I also want to welcome to the chamber members of the International Voluntary Service who are working to raise the profile of this day in Scotland and such promotions contributed to this debate taking place. I would like on top of that to thank and welcome uh, chamber, to the chamber members of organisation which comprise the cross-party group on nuclear disarmament. As we recognise this auspicious day, I would like to use this debate to explain what international peace looks like in practice and why, as politicians, we have the capacity, mechanisms and responsibility to promote the UN International Day of Peace. So what does international peace actually look like? Does it mean no wars and no conflict? Well, ideally, yes, it does. But peace is a more useful concept when you use it as a goal for something complex and difficult, not impossible to achieve. In, internal, inter, in international relations, the most prominent understanding of peace seminally put forward by Johann Galtung in 1969 explained that peace relies on our capacity to create peace, or alternatively, our capacity to stop violence. Terming peace in this way stops it being an unattainable thing. It makes peace both real and tangible. It's something that we can make a solid contribution towards. Peace is the absence of violence. We are lucky enough these days to live in times of peace here in Scotland. The normal experience of Scottish people nowadays is very different to what people had to live through and die for during large parts of the 20th century. Most notable is the sacrifice, of course, made in World War I and World War II. And Global Peace Day is an opportunity to recognise the contribution of all those who fought to provide peace for their children and grandchildren, the heavy and moving sacrifice of which we live in today. The creation of a peaceful society for us to live in also allows for us to consider a second layer to peace. This is a type of peace which involves the reduction of structural violence or social inequality, as it is better known these days. One of the biggest movements towards reducing social inequality on an international scale is the United Nations Global Goals. These goals provide action points for countries to tackle worldwide issues, such as hunger and poverty. They also provide direction on how to promote quality education, renewable energy, innovation, infrastructure, climate change, justice and human rights. This again roots back to the key point about our ability to reduce inequality. Structural violence or inequality, which the global goals work against, happens when a person's well-being, either mental or physical, is reduced below where it could and should reasonably be. Before institutions like the United Nations, it would have been difficult to make an international effort to reduce hunger, but now we have a greater ability to do so. And a good example for explaining capacity to reduce violence or social inequality would be if someone had an illness like cholera in the Victorian era and died from dehydration. At that time, the medical profession did not know what cholera was or how to remedy it. They didn't have the knowledge, they didn't have the ability to help that person. However, if someone today loses their life to an easily preventable and remedied illness, such as cholera, then we could say that violence has been committed on that person. If we have the capacity to reduce inequality, then we must strive to find ways to do this. Today, this could involve a fair distribution of medical supplies and access to doctors, which the NHS is a fantastic example of. 
If we have the ability to actively promote peace and the capacity to make a change, then we have the responsibility to do so. As parliamentarians, we here are privileged to be in a position to affect legislation working towards peace, whether it be on climate justice by voting in the Climate Change Bill or voting in the Child Poverty Act. We have the ability to be ambitious in promoting peace. As mentioned, the United Nations increases our ability to promote peace as it provides the opportunity for collaboration. In 2001, the General Assembly of the United Nations voted to mark the International Day of Peace as a day of non-violence and ceasefire. And since this has come into being, it has been allowing the delivery of aid to vulnerable groups within conflict zones. An incredible example of this is how the organization of Peace One Day has worked with UNICEF and the World Health Organization for the immunization of 1.4 million children against polio in insecure southern and eastern regions of Afghanistan. The Global Peace Day ceasefire has seen the Taliban put down arms recurrently since 2007 to allow safe passage for aid workers. It's clear that in many cases we, have, we do have the ability to make a difference. For me personally, this means working towards nuclear disarmament. I want to see weapons which indiscriminately kill hundreds of thousands of innocent people abolished. If you, thank you. If you are undecided about nuclear weapons, then please use this peace day to look at the work of ICANN, PNND, or Scottish CND for further explanation of the humanitarian impact of these weapons. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had survivors, but they were not physically recognizable to their loved ones after the bombings. That cannot be allowed to happen again. As many of you know, ICANN won the Nobel Peace Prize last year for their work in bringing about the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The next major step for nuclear disarmament will be the UN High-Level Conference, which I will be attending and where we will count out $1 trillion, which is the amount of money wasted on nuclear weapons every year around the world. Whether it is this or another matter of importance, I compel you where you have the ability to promote peace, do so. It can be complex, it can be difficult, but it cannot and is not impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. Open debate, uh, Linda Fabiani, followed by Alexandra Stewart. Ms. Fabiani, please. Uh, thank you very, very much, presiding officer, and thank you, Bill, um, for the persistence that Bill Kidd has, presiding officer, in bringing such issues to our parliament on a regular basis. Uh, I, I very much um, wanted just to contribute today mainly uh, to, to celebrate the volunteers who do so much fantastic work worldwide in the name of peace. And, and Bill Kidd outlined some of the work that's done there. And uh, so many people um, look at the declarations of the UN, the different days we have, and somehow think that it's not that important, but it's truly important because it brings so many people together and it brings the issues together and puts them at the forefront. And when you look closely at the, the different declarations that are made by the UN, by nations coming together, uh, whether it be the global goals, uh, whether it be the declarations that Bill has talked about today, um, they tie in together in a way of trying to create a big picture of citizens coming together and saying, this is not right and we have to work to make our world a better place. And there was another uh, declaration made by the UN uh, some 50 years after the human rights one, which was the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. I think that's also a very, very important one because human rights defenders are other volunteers who go out there to make sure that that structural peace can be maintained by human rights workers being defended. And Peace Brigades International, I should probably declare an interest in that, I've been a member of the organization for many years, um, not to the degree that others are in the work that they do, though I hope perhaps someday I might be able to, to help more than I do at the moment. But Peace Brigades International, they, they do fantastic work. 
Um, and that's why I put down a motion myself about that, and thank you to those who signed it. Um, uh, Peace Brigades International currently work in seven countries. They're working in Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, Kenya, Indonesia, and Mexico. And they're working in countries where communities experience violent, violent conflict. And as was outlined by Bill Kidd in his motion and in the work that he does, it can be conflict within a nation as well as conflict amongst nations. It's about repression, internal uh, oppression, as well as external aggression. And the, the philosophy of Peace Brigades International is that uh, lasting transformation of conflicts cannot come from the outside, but it must be based on the capacities and desires of local people. So you have volunteers promoting peace, whether it be the International Voluntary Service, so many different strands of that, whether it be organisations that are very specific, like Peace Brigades International, actually showing on the ground that a different way is useful. Um, the work with trained volunteers involves physical accompaniment, uh, capacity development workshops, advocacy tours, and raising concerns for human rights defenders. And that's another way that people that work in this field come together. All these different organisations come together, truly believe in peace and in promoting peace, and the responsibility of those of us who are fortunate enough to live in a peaceful society to try and spread some of that peace to others. I could go on a long time about this presiding officer, but I'm looking at the time. And uh, so all I would like to say is uh, thank you very, very much to the International Voluntary Service in promoting Peace Day 2018 here in Scotland. Thank you to all those who do more than just pay money to Peace Brigades International, but actually go out and do the hard work on the ground. And I would urge those who don't know um, an awful lot about these organisations to look into them deeper. Thank you very much, Mr. Abiani. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Mr. Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Delighted to be able to take part today, and I congratulate and commend Bill Kidd for securing this debate this afternoon. Each year, the International Day of Peace is observed around the world on the 21st of September, as you already heard, and the UN General Assembly has declared that this day is devoted to strengthening the ideas of peace both within and among the nations and its peoples. So giving peace a chance, and I think that's what we need to ensure we do. Back in 2015, the United Nations member states adopted the ideas of 17 sustainable development goals as they understood it, and it would not be possible to build a peaceful world without steps to achieve economic and social development from everyone, uh, and to ensure that their rights were protected. It's vitally important that their rights are protected. These sustainable goals covered a broad range of ideas, including poverty, hunger, health education, climate change, gender equality, water, energy, environment, and social justice. And each and every one of them play a part to ensure that we can achieve the goals that they set. They are the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for us all, a peaceful future for us all. The goals address the global challenges that we face, including these related to inequality, climate and environment, and justice, peace in itself. The goals are in order to enlevel, to, to ensure that we all have a responsibility, and these should be achieved by 2030. Deputy Presiding Officer, the theme for International Day of Peace 2018 is the right to peace, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at 70. And we thank all of those who have played a part. We've heard already about World War I, and we're going to be commemorating some anniversaries as we go forward, and what happened in World War II. These individuals gave of their time, their talent, and their lives to secure peace for all of us, and that's vitally important that we remember them. The theme of the celebrations uh, talks about the human rights, and that whole idea is a milestone to discover, and we should ensure these human rights. Drafted from responsibilities with different legal and cultural backgrounds from all regions of the world, it's vitally important. And going back as far as the 10th of December 1940, when the common standard was achieved for peoples of all nations, the Universal Declaration is the most translated document in the world and has been available and has been translated into over 500 languages. It is as relevant today as it was the day it was adopted. 
The Universal Declaration states that Article 3, that everyone has the right to life, liberty, security of person. These elements build on the foundations of freedom, justice and peace around the world. All of us in society can play our part. It is important that we tackle these and we take these steps in our day-to-day -day lives. Each and every one of us in this chamber has an opportunity to do that. We can promote human rights. We can work with human rights. We can ensure our work, uh, our home environments, in our education, at our schools, colleges, and even around a dinner table that we talk about human rights. We talk about the opportunities that are there to ensure. Human rights are everyone's rights, and we have the responsibility to maintain that, to help to keep peace. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, a peaceful society is one where there is justice and equality for everyone. This is an end to what we're trying to fulfill. And the prophecy that came from the United Nations is very true. Peace will endure a sustainable environment to take shape and a sustainable environment will in, in turn help to promote peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by John Finney. Ms. Beamish, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I wish to congratulate Bill Kidd on his motion and thank him for giving us the opportunity to debate on such an important issue as peace today in the lead-up to the International Day on the 21st. I would also like to recognise the member for his tireless efforts, travelling to a number of significant meetings uh, across the globe to represent Scotland in the peace movement and much of the other work that he does, including in the... Um, cross-party group against nuclear weapons. This year we celebrate, as we have heard, the 70th anniversary of the De Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a milestone document in the history of human rights, which, as we've heard from Alexander Stewart um, earlier um, in, in his remarks, uh, in its Article 3 states that everyone has the right to life, liberty and security, building the foundation of justice, freedom and peace amongst peoples and nations. Yet many times these fundamental principles that recognize our dignity and inalienable basic rights as human beings are being breached across the globe, not only in war-torn countries, not only in dictatorship nations, not only in developing countries, but if I may say so, here as well. We all have a right to peace, peace in our homes, peace in our communities, and peace in our countries and between countries. Sometimes we only see peace as the mere absence of conflict and believe we have achieved it in all its forms and shapes and forget that peace is hardly ever a permanent status of the human race, but rather a very fragile condition that we must pursue and protect at all times. We must, I suggest, all consider recommitting to working to reduce what uh, Bill Kidd has highlighted as structural inequalities, both globally and here in Scotland. We can and must continue to be leaders on climate change, for instance, which is in my brief and on other issues that are right across this parliament, um, as well as on the global sustainable development goals. Nonetheless, even if we in our free, democratic and reasonably prosperous and reasonably equal country um, are striving for peace, we still face major challenges when it comes to guaranteeing our citizens' safety. And this will always be the case as long as nuclear weapons are here on our soil. While we still have weapons of mass destruction, as well as the requirement to transport them, I'm not quite sure that we can describe our nation as peaceful. I've been involved in the peace movement, not as much as others, but over a long period of time. And I strongly believe that today more than ever, we need to bring more young people into this dialogue and ensure that they have the appropriate knowledge and adequate tools to influence change and achieve lasting results. In July, I had the honor to speak at the Peace Campaigning Academy organized by CND Education, a three day long event. And it was very important that young people were able to learn more about nuclear weapons and equally importantly, that they found out about lobbying activities to lobby us as their parliamentarians, communication tactics and ways to engage in legislative processes more. It was incredible to be part of this Peace Academy and very inspiring, um, along with uh, Bill Kidd and also Ross Greer, who were there as well to share their ideas and to hear so many people, so many young people's commitment 
And my thanks also goes to Quakers in Scotland for their briefing for this debate. They too know the value of peace education for young people. Active involvement of younger generations is fundamental to ensure we create and sustain a society which is not only aware of the social issues and challenges of its communities, but has the knowledge and power to shape its future. I would like to conclude by quoting a wonderful sentence from Mr. Masashi, a survivor of the Hiroshima bombings in 1945, who said, humans cannot coexist with nuclear weapons. Let's work together for a world of peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Beamish. I call John Finney to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr. Finney, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, President Officer. Can I join with others in uh, congratulating Bill, not only in bringing this debate, but thanking him for all the, the other work he does. And I think UN International Day of Peace has, has got a nice ring to it. And uh, I only wish that some people would show their respect to the UN on, uh, with regard to matters like adherence to international law. It's very reassuring to hear uh, my colleague Claudia Beamish talk about the Peace Academy and the work that went on with uh, Ross Greer and, and Bill Kidd. I think that's the future and actually empowering young people in the way I think is to be commended. Now, the motion talks about the UN's understanding of peace as being structural rather than just an absence of violence, and that's very clearly the case. I, 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 I look um, at some of the terminology that's used in relation to this, and I know that the UN Security Council asked the then General uh, Secretary Boutros Boutros Ghali in 1992 to uh, examine uh, ways to improve peacekeeping and peace enforcement, and I think these are key phrases. And, it was in the paper Agenda for Peace that uh, he used the phrase uh, peace building and peace building as post-conflict social and political reconstruction activities because of course peace is often associated with the aftermath of great terror that's visited invariably on the, 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 the most vulnerable in our communities. Um, and of course, importantly, peace building is about preventing a, a, a repetition and it's dialogue that's going to do that. It's not a proliferation of weapons, whatever these weapons may be. Um, and it's distinguished from peacekeeping, peacekeeping and peacemaking by its insistence on a society-wide reconciliation. And the role of truth and reconciliation in, in conflict, I think, is, is to be commended. And uh, we've seen that in South Africa, we've seen it in the Balkans, and hopefully it will uh, continue to be the case in the north of Ireland. Um, because um, it, it is about state building thereafter, and that is about valuing the citizen, and there's a role that the citizen can play in prevention. Um, and uh, talking, talking's never harmed anyone, and I, I think uh, we can't uh, commend that enough. Now, there's been a number of mentions made of uh, Trident um, and wasted money. I think all arms uh, money is wasted money. It's wasted energy, and I think there are opportunities for citizens to, to display their position on that by encouraging divestment. So, on the particulars of the motions, can I thank the International Voluntary Service for their, their uh, uh, outstanding work? And I, I took the opportunity to have a look at their webpage and some of their values, which I've shamelessly uh, plagiarised now, and say that one of the first ones that's mentioned there is service, uh, locally led action for social change. Now, that's something I think everyone in this chamber would commend talking about turning, uh, supporting, in turn that supports behavioural change. And of course, if we're going to have sustainable peace, then we can't have um, uh, anything other than every effort made to reduce violence where it exists and resolve conflict. Respect, respect, I think, again, is key to this. And this is about respecting each other's differences, indeed valuing each other's differences. They talk about we celebrate differences in nationality, ethnicity, gender and background. I think the world's richer for all the differences we have, not weaker because of it. Integrity is something else that's in their values, and ambition. Now, we all have ambitions, and we have some very refined ambitions regarding nuances of policies here, but surely the one thing that we can all throw our weight behind is an ambition to see a world where there's collaboration and innovation, two of their other um, uh, uh, values, and most importantly, peace. So, um, you know, uh, I think it was Bill Kidd that talked about water, food, and education, the UN Global um, Goals Agenda, um, and human rights. Uh, and human rights bring with the responsibilities, and we all have responsibilities. And I think there's a tendency in the so-called civilized waste to think that a lot of these issues are issues for the third, the developing world, call it what you will. The Scottish Greens have a, a mantra of people, plants, and peace, and I think that's in common with a lot of the, the, the individual members in here. We see these as being the priorities. I'd like to thank Bill for bringing this and uh, commend the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I gently remind members to use full names, please, in the chamber? Uh, I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Ms. McGuire, please. 
Thank you. On UN International Day of Peace 2018, we devote ourselves to strengthening ideals of peace, both within and among all nations and peoples. A peaceful society is one where there's justice and equality for everyone. Presiding officer, I'm really grateful to my colleague Bill Kidd for securing this important debate, which means we can come together in the chamber to observe, as many others will around the world, International Day of Peace. Bill Kidd, of course, has years and years of service <laughs> to the peace movement, and I'm hugely grateful for all his hard work and commitment to the cause. The theme for 2018 is the right to peace, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at 70, and celebrates the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is a milestone document in the history of human rights drafted by representatives with different legal and cultural backgrounds from all regions of the world. The declaration was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in Paris on the 10th of December 1948 as a common standard of achievement for all peoples, for all nations. The Universal Declaration is the most translated document in the world and is available in more than 500 languages. It is as relevant today as it was on the day it was adopted. The Universal Decla Declaration states in Article 3, everyone has the right to life, liberty and security of person. These elements build the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world. Yet, the Universal Declaration does not include a separate article on the right to peace. That is why this year we're being asked to think about what the right to peace means. And those wishing to get involved in that global discussion can share their thoughts and ideas on social media using the hashtag Peace Day and hashtag Stand Up for Human Rights. Presiding officer, when I think about peace, I think about more than the absence of violence. I think about more than the absence of war. I think about a just and equal society. A society where everyone can achieve their full potential, where no one is left behind, and where we help, nurture, and protect those who need it. And of course, as well as thinking and talking, we can all act. As individuals, we can seek peaceful resolution of conflict in our everyday life when disagreements arise around us. Even in taking small steps, we can be part of the solution. Prevent an injustice in your friend group, in your school, in your college, in your workplace. We can adopt a non-violent approach to solving and reporting potential crimes including online bullying. You can speak up when others are at risk and you can simply stand with others. And whether you choose to do this at your dinner table, in the street, at your school, in a workplace, on the media, in a parliament, or indeed at a nuclear submarine base, it all matters and it all helps. Human rights are everyone's rights and this International Peace Day Let's remember that we can all act and each and every one of us can stand up for rights every day. Thank you very much. I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Ruth Rona Mackay. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the United Nations International Day of Peace and I thank Bill Kidd very much for bringing this members' debate today to the Chamber. This Friday, this Friday nations around the world will mark their commitment to peace on a day which has been globally shared since 1981. Peace is something that should never be taken for granted, and so having this time to recognize its significance in our everyday lives must be appreciated. It is inherently linked to our rights as, a, as citizens and as humans. Only by having these rights secured and protected can nations and individuals regain their dignity. Together, they act as a core foundation for a peaceful society wherever we are. I am sure Parliament today will join me in supporting the good work done by the United Nations. This organization has worked long and hard to prevent the onset of wars in some of the most dangerous environments. It serves to calm disputes, restore peace if armed conflict does, not ar does arise, and to promote lasting peace for those countries which have emerged from the troubles of war. I pay particular tribute to the United Nations for its tireless efforts, evident in that it's making in its peace many peacekeeping uh, missions throughout the years. Indeed, we can look back on its contribution to the restoration of stability in Sierra Leone, Namibia, and, Komodi and Cambodia. I'm sorry, I can hear you, Mr. Corey, but I suspect not oh, other... I beg your pardon, sorry. 
Sorry, just before I on. just check, uh, if the official report didn't hear you, I, I hope you'll be able to pass your material over rather than re rehearse it all again. My apologies. I just, uh, yeah. Thank you. I pay a particular tribute to the United Nations for its tireless efforts, evident in its many peacekeeping missions throughout the years. Indeed, we can look back on its contribution. Yes. John Finney. Thank yes, you. Yes, I'm very grateful for the member taking the intervention on that point, and, and I fully agree with him on respect for the United Nations. Would that apply, in the member's opinion, to resolutions that are passed condemning countries or asking countries to act in line with international law, like, for instance, Israel? Maurice um, Corrie. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I, I note the, uh, the, the member's uh, intervention there and thank him for it. Um, yes, I think it depends on the circumstances, uh, and everyone is different. There's no one common uh, plan for each one, and I think one has to be very careful before you make a judgment in that case. Thank you. <clears throat> As the UN believes, these successes help to foster a culture of peace which opens the doors for vital development goals to be reached, such as the eradication of poverty and hunger, the promotion of universal re-education, and the reduction in child mortality. The International Day of Peace offers us time not to, to just reflect on how we as nations cooperate with each other, but what more can be done to actively obtain freedom, opportunity, and protection. From my own experience in the armed forces, I've witnessed what life is like for those who do not live in countries free from war and injustice. With these military experiences, I can wholly appreciate the security we enjoy within our own borders, where favoring deterrence by the presence of UN forces, which has been of enormous benefit in the prevention of land conflict. I believe that this is a necessity and we should appreciate in our goal of lasting security and acceptance of every human right. This year, the, de the theme of Peace Day is the right of peace, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at 70. The Universal Declaration uh, is a monumental document which charts the necessity of human rights and sets a shared high standard for their protection. Without our freedom of expression, our right to partake in public affairs and our right to live in a free and just world, individuals cannot enjoy a lasting, genuine culture of peace within their nations. In the current international climate, human trafficking, intentional murder, and sexual violence are still major threats to our aim for peaceful societies. Unthinkable and widespread atrocities seen in nations such as Syria and Somalia, to name but a few, lead to a mass displacement and civil unrest. For this week's International Day of Peace, the theme asks us what the right of peace means to us. Surely it means that further international cooperation and support of the United Nations is needed to deal with the challenges these nations face. There are a wealth of ways that we can participate in Peace Day this Friday, whether it be through our schools, sports, the arts, or the environment. I am pleased to see that this International Day of Peace will be highlighted in events across Scotland. Indeed, the University of Dundee is offering a talk on democracy and security of Gambia, which is now entering a new political era and seeks to strengthen its links with other international partners. Allenton Peace Sanctuary in Lanarkshire gives the opportunity to plant peace poles, which are universally recognized as a symbol for peace. It is estimated that over 200,000 peace poles have now been planted across the world since this project first began in Japan in 1976. In Glasgow, the public are invited to participate in one minute silence, followed by meditation and both, to both acknowledge and celebrate the Peace Day. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope that this, day, this year's International Day of Peace, we recognize what has been done and what can still be done to further cooperation both within and among nations in our world today. Thank you. Thank you. And before I call Rona Mackay, can I have two members still wishing to speak in this debate, so I'm therefore minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. And I now invite Bill Kidd to move a motion without notice. I move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That's agreed, so I now call Rona Mackay to be followed by Tom Arthur, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Mackay, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I too thank Bill Kidd for bringing this debate to the Chamber and for his long-standing commitment to peace and ridding the world of nuclear weapons. The theme of this year's International Day of Peace, as we've heard, is the right to peace, which celebrates the 70th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, and it's entirely fitting, because everyone has a right to peace. It's a fundamental human right. 
Sadly, however, we know that this right has been eroded throughout the world as we witness horrific scenes of needless violence and wars taking place in far too many places throughout the world. The heartbreaking scenes we see daily on the news of children suffering as collateral damage or in some cases being specifically targeted actually defy belief. How can humanity become so badly eroded in a person or collectively in a regime that this is thought to be acceptable? So the world looks on helplessly as children suffer in Syria and the Yemen and in places which have yet to make headlines. How many more must die or be maimed before the regimes that are responsible stop the killing? The Quaker Society briefing, for which I thank them, states their belief that Scotland can be a country that leads others in peace, but that peace, far from being passive, is an active thing that has to be pursued, encouraged and performed on a continual basis to exist. There is a difference between merely keeping the peace and actively encouraging conflict resolution. They rightly say that when the world appears to be so divided, becoming less tolerant and compassionate, that Scotland should make a commitment to learning about and modelling peace as a first step to becoming world leaders in this area. Presiding officer, there's nothing I would want more, and I suspect everyone in this chamber. But until the Westminster government stops sending arms to regimes who use them to maim children and cause horrific widespread suffering, the killing will go on. Our nation, the nation of Scotland, cannot become peacekeepers or actively encourage conflict resolution until we have control over our own independent defence industry. I say to the Westminster government, do not send arms to countries who kill children in my name, in my family's name or in Scotland's name. Presiding officer, my 98-year-old father-in-law, who's now sadly in his last month, fled for his life in a coal ship from Dunkirk. Like all veterans, he lost best friends and saw things a 17-year-old should never have to see or do. Until recently, he said very little about his traumatic experience during the Second World War. But the family now knows that he believes wars do not solve anything and that peaceful resolution must be sought at all costs. I agree with him, despite the achievements and sacrifices so many made in that war, which did have a legitimate aim. Presiding officer, we can never stop countries breaking into civil war or committing violence on its people. But I say again, we must not be enablers and we must not use force in a quest for peace. We know from experience in Iraq and Afghanistan that this doesn't work. We should not forget either that war has not broken out between European countries while they've been a member of the European Union. But then that's another debate entirely. And of course, peace is not just about stopping wars. It's about how we live our lives in common humanity, as Bill Kidd outlined and, and many others have said. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, has asked us all to speak up for gender equality and promote inclusive societies, do our part at school, at work, at home, talking to friends and family, and stand up for human rights and call out those who abuse them. Every step counts. Let's all act to promote, promote and defend human rights for all in the name of lasting peace for us and for future generations. Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm uh, very grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate. And I, I would like to uh, begin by thanking my colleague uh, Bill Kidd for securing this debate. I, I must confess that I had not intended to speak, but Bill Kidd's speech was so powerful and compelling and moving um, that I, I, I felt I moved to respond and, and, and share some of my thoughts. And before doing so, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Ben McPherson to his new role. I know Ben is a, a champion and campaigner for peace both at home and internationally, and I have every confidence that he's going to excel in his new position. I'm very much looking forward to his response to this debate. Presiding officer, t two days ago I had the great pleasure of attending um, a service in, in Paisley Abbey, which was to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Royal Air Force, and also in doing so to remember the sacrifice of airmen over the past century, and particularly airmen and airwomen, and particularly in the Battle of Britain. And as I was listening to the various remarks and contributions that have been made throughout this debate, I was reflecting back to that service and two of the key lessons that we learned from those two global catastrophes of the First and Second World War, and in particular their origins and what they tell us about peace and how fragile peace is. It's, it's well known to any high school student of history that World War I perhaps could be characterised as having happened by accident misunderstanding, misreading, and people being compelled into taking action. 
Clearly there were events that led up to it, but it was a conflict that no one wanted, no one needed, and until very shortly before it occurred, not many people saw coming. And that speaks to the importance for communication, for understanding, for giving the benefit of the doubt, for a willingness to be able to empathize and understand other people's positions and situations, and to take opportunities to steer off catastrophe long before it happens. The lessons from World War II are somewhat different in how war came about. The gradual erosion of what is fundamental to peace, and that is civic society. It is an independent judiciary. It's free and open and transparent elections and a strong democracy. It's a free press, the ability to criticize, but fundamentally what is required in such societies is a willingness to be able to engage and communicate with each other. A common set of understandings of what counts as truth and fact and the lessons of the decay of Weimar into what emerged in Germany in the 1930s and the consequent conflagration that engulfed Europe are lessons that are as valuable as ever. We are in a society where, in a global society, particularly in the West, where we have the rise of fake news, a tribal and entrenched politics where two sides can't speak to each other, sides looking for the easy goal, uh, the easy media hit, rather than necessarily searching for the truth, seeking to simplify rather than admit complexity. And that is a danger because it can result in the breakdown of civil, civil society. And the common thread through all of this debate has been that peace is not something that is natural or exists. It is something that is hard when one. It is something that must be built and rebuilt constantly. It is such a fragile entity. And I think in, as we mark UN International Day of Peace 2018, as we look across the world and we look at our democratic and civic, civic institutions that are under threat from extremes on both sides of the political spectrum, it is absolutely imperative that we recommit ourselves to building peace, not just in the global sense, but at home and in how we conduct ourselves in our daily lives and our attitudes towards each other. And I hope that is a message that will resonate from this chamber today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Ben McPherson to close with the government. Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And it's a real privilege to speak in conclusion of this really illuminative and important debate that we've had here this evening. As others have, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Bill Kidd for bringing this motion to, to debate today. It's such an important motion for all of us to think about not just the day of peace itself, but the wider points around it, as has been described and, and, and commented upon by several members. This motion and subject and area is of interest to me, not just in my capacity as minister, but also one that is close to me on a personal level. And at this point, I declare an interest that as a idealistic but determined 20-year-old and uh, disheartened by the Iraq war in 2003 but determined to do something in the cause of peace, walked from Edinburgh to London to raise awareness of Peace Day in that year and then worked for Peace One Day that Bill Kidd mentioned the year after in 2005. And I did that then uh, because I believed, as I believe now, that a more peaceful world is possible and by spreading awareness through debates like we're having this evening and all of the activism that has been described across the chamber, we can promote a peace, more peaceful world. And Peace Day gives us the chance to reflect and act on that sense of common purpose. As the former Secretary General of the United Nations, who sadly passed away this summer, Kofi Annan, said in support of, of Peace Day, any moment, whether it's a day or a week, when we can get the competence to pause, to think, and reflect on what they are doing to their own people and to the environment will be a great achievement and I would support it 100%. And as was referenced by Bill Kidd, that sense of reflection can also have really significant practical implications, whether it's the International Voluntary Service 
raising awareness here in Scotland, as I did on my walk to London and others have done in their activism, creating peace in our communities, or whether it's what Bill Kidd described, the real practical life-saving implications of Peace Day. For example, in 2007, when the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and the Afghan Ministry of Health immunized 1.4 million children in 2007 against polio and then 1.6 million in 2008 against polio. This shows that these concepts of peace can have a real impact in terms of lives saved and communities uh, protected. It is clear from the debate that we have this we've had this evening as well that Scotland has a role to play as a nation uh, which does its bit to promote peace overseas. A nation that endeavours to be a good global citizen and a nation whose domestic policies reflect the fair and sustainable approach we aim to achieve in our international engagement. And of course, one of the key contributions that Scotland can make towards promoting peace is our commitment to all of the UN goals, not just goal, goal 16, but all of them, as part of the, the structural peace building that others have mentioned. The global goals provide an integrated framework to achieving a better and more sustainable future for all, addressing common challenges re relating to poverty, inequality, climate, peace and justice. And in the Scottish Government, we have made a dual commitment to the global goals, domestically for Scotland and in contributing internationally through our international development work. Our international development strategy outlines the approach we will be taking between now and 2030 to help reduce global poverty and promote sustainable development and human rights. And partnership and collaboration will continue to be the foundation for our future development work as we build on our existing bilateral partnerships with Malawi, Zambia, Rwanda and Pakistan, working across borders to address the shared challenges our world faces in pursuit of these goals. And of course, we also have our humanitarian emergency fund as well for moments of, of crisis. And we are conscious that in order to act with credibility in, in other places, we must also work to protect and promote human rights and address poverty and inequalities here in Scotland. And that is why our domestic policy has at its heart sustainable inclusive economic growth and our commitment to a fairer Scotland. And just as we are committed to achieving greater social justice, we are also committed to protecting human rights. The UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is grounded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted 70 years ago. And in Scotland, we are committed to giving further and better effect to international human rights standards encapsulated in the Declaration. This commitment of making rights real in people's everyday lives is reflected in the new National Performance Framework, which has an explicit human rights indicator, and our commitment to human rights is also demonstrated by the Scottish Government's work to fulfil our obligations across the seven core UN human treaties to which the UK is a party. That includes measures to tackle poverty and promote fair work, to eliminate racial discrimination, to promote gender equality and disabled people's rights, and to use the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child as a framework to ensure that children's rights are embedded in all decision making and of course that is particularly important in this year of young people. As the programme for government demonstrates, equality is firmly embedded throughout all of the government's activities. That starts at the heart of government, where we have one of the few gender-based cabinets in the world. And this all matters when it comes to aspiring to the ideal of peace day, because creating the structural conditions others, others have mentioned to support international peace at a domestic level, provides support to global societies managing inequalities and conflict as well. We have embedded a refreshed international framework, a focus on tackling inequality, and this means that all of our international engagement is engaged, guided by our commitment to the universally recognized values enshrined in human rights treaties. And this includes, of course, what we provide to refugees, asylum seekers, and our local communities through the pioneering and collaborative approach of our new Scots refugee assistance strategy. In conclusion, presiding officer, 
So much could be said about Peace Day and Scotland's role in it. Scotland has a unique contribution to offer the world through our people's expertise on education, health improvement, climate change, renewable energy, human rights and research, along with our innovative partnership approach to international development. And we will be continuing to evolve that through our international development work. We are already making a significant contribution, sharing particular knowledge, skills and technical expertise globally, and we will continue to do so. By taking a fair, sustainable and inclusive approach, we demonstrate that we are a country that promotes human rights, democratic values and supports the structures and global efforts involved in promoting international peace. In this time of flux and challenge, Peace Day on Friday and in the years ahead is a chance to promote ceasefire and non-violence, not just for 24 hours, but in the wider context of social justice, the global goals and sustainable development. And in that spirit, and in the words of Kofi Annan that I referenced earlier, I support it 100% and encourage all to mark Peace Day this Friday in what they do, whether that's in social media, their communities or their everyday lives. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.